you're broken down and tired
good you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before i took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me and oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god oh it chases me down fights till i'm found leaves the 99 i couldn't earn it i don't deserve it still you give yourself away your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down. deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god deserve it still you gave yourself away and oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god no go ahead Tara. go ahead Tara. hi there welcome to stone coast community church we're so excited to have you with us let's go ahead and pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together as a community online. 
We ask you to be uh, present in this message. We invite you into the message, Lord. We thank you for continuing to pursue us, uh, regardless of where we are in our faith journey. Lord, let us just uh, hear your word today through your parables. And we thank you for the message and anticipate great things in front of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi there. Welcome to Stone Coast. I'm Cara Daniello. I'm part of the team here. We're so excited to have you join us. Um, if you're fairly new to us, we'd like to uh, thank you for coming. And for uh, for that, we'd love to mail you a little gift just to just to thank you for being part of our community. Um, and uh, if you're fairly new to the Stone Coast family and haven't filled out a connect form, we'd ask you to do that so we can connect with you and um, and just see how we can serve you best. Uh, you could go ahead and click the link in the Facebook feed if you're watching us on Facebook, or you can, uh, if you're on our website, you can click on the Connect card there. If uh, we're able to do just the amazing things that we do as a church community because of the generous giving uh, that you all do, we'd love to invite you to participate in giving to support the many efforts of Stone Coast. You can do so by clicking on the link in the comments um, and also on our website, uh, you can click the word give. Before I send it over to Sean, and we'd also love to invite you to um, share this message. So you can go ahead, if you're on Facebook, and go ahead and uh, click share so your friends can just be part of receiving uh, an encouraging word today. Uh, we're looking forward to today's message on the parable of the lost sheep and uh, and what's in front of us. So thank you for joining us, and I'll see you at the end of service. Hey, everyone. Good morning. I'm Sean Smith, and uh, I'm the pastor at Stone Coast Community Church, and certainly glad to hear, to be with you. And thank you, Kara, for, for doing that and just getting us ready, and for Amanda leading us in, in worship. Uh, it's so good to, to be together with each other. And uh, we're going to continue in our series. So we're in a series called Stories That Change the World. And these are focusing on the parables of Jesus. And it's so, uh, to me, they're riveting. Like the, the parables are meant to take real life illustrations, right? Like that's why they did a lot of things with agriculture and, um, and farming and different things that made sense to them. Today, we're going to be looking at like what they did with shepherding. And in that... Uh, there's something very, very practical, and Jesus is using those things so that people can identify with what he's saying, and it's so important for us to put ourselves into the story. And if you allow yourself, it's very riveting because Jesus is going to uh, use something of the day in order to teach a principle that he wants us to get about the kingdom, uh, what he wants us to get about life in itself, right? How, how to live this life better and more fully. And then, of course, he's going to be teaching us about his kingdom. And so these, these parables are meant to, to, to get people's attention and to challenge the status quo. And so um, my prayer this morning is that all of us would, would enter into these stories and be riveted by them so that they would help us to see and experience the life and the love of Jesus Christ in a whole new way. Uh, some of you may have been tuning in from over Christmas uh, some new new folks may have been, be coming on today, and we're certainly glad that you're here with us. And these stories, I really encourage you to participate, to interact, to, to ask questions, because these stories are meant to stimulate thought, to engage in conversation, to be reflective, and to really wrestle with. It's very, very important to, to, to engage in this. So if you have any questions, please put them in the feed. This whole experience is meant to be interactive. And so um, one of the things that's really important to note is that Jesus was a master teacher. That's not, it's not the reason why he came, right? Some people think he was just a great prophet, a great teacher, stuff like that, which he was, but um, that's not why he came. But knowing that he is a master teacher, it does have significance because it's one of those things. It's like if you can lean into it as the teacher and we being the students, we can learn something about life. We can learn something about our character development. We can learn something about how to live this life more fully, uh, have a life of significance, etc. So uh, I encourage you to do this. this. These stories have been told for millions of years um, and have impacted and transformed millions of people's lives. And so my prayer is that that would happen for all of us today. All right. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about the relentless, relentless love of God. And 
I know like this weekend is in, is in a tribute and honor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so even though I don't have something directly correlated to that, I think if you tune in and you really lean into what I'm sharing, you'll see that there's a dotted line back to him, that this, this actually, this teaching would be very honoring to him because it's talking about, um, you know, a, a group of people that involves all people. And that God loves all people. He wants us to see us in community with each other. So you're going to see that this is a message of love and of hope. And generally speaking, you'll see, I think, the message and the, the, the life, if you will, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He'd be honored by this. So um, I hope that you can, you can get that out of it because he's such a, um, a great person of history that truly shaped lives, shaped society. And for me as a Christ follower, right? Like he was, there's something for us to glean from. So Jesus' teachings informed his life as I want them to inform our lives. And so uh, I'm going to read to you what's known as the parable of the lost sheep. So please stand as you are able and uh, for the reading of God's word. This is something, obviously, I know that not everyone is, is able to do that. But if you're able to, just please go ahead and stand with us for the reading of God's word. We're going to read from Luke 15. And it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And may God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for doing that. Um, now, <laughs> I'm just curious, you can put in the feed, um, are there any pet lovers in here? So if you're a pet lover, put some thumbs up um, and also put in your favorite pet. I want to know uh, what, you know, what is your favorite pet? And you'll see why. Obviously, this is talking about sheep. <laughs> I'd be surprised if any of you put that in there. Um, but as you're putting that in there, I, like I said, I want this to be participatory. So just throw in there, thumbs up if you're a pet lover. And then what's your favorite pet? All right. Now, I'm going to go on record. I'm a pet liker. <laughs> Not sure I'm a pet lover. Um, but I would have to say, <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting some dirty looks here in the studio. Um, I would have to say dogs are, for me, um, you know, what I like best. And so I want to tell you a funny little story. So this is with one of my, uh, as a family, right? So <laughs> some of you may not know me. I'm married to Diane. We have three beautiful kids who are now adult children, um, 22, 20, and 18. But when the kids were younger, you know, I have no idea how old they were, but let's say they were like, you know, five, seven, and nine or something like that. <laughs> so we had a dog named Kelly and it was a, a soft coat of wheat and terrier, right? And so we, Diane and I went away for, I don't know, a, a couple of nights. We were in New Hampshire, right? It's the middle of the winter time. It's like 10 degrees out. So I had my next door neighbor. His name's Michael. And <laughs> Mike said it was in his, probably in his 20s at the time. And um, so I just asked him, I said, look, you just have to check on him. Uh, just take him out at nighttime, you know, just to make sure he goes to the bathroom. Then he'll be good for the night, right? <laughs> so I guess Mike came over around 10, 11 o'clock at night and somehow, I don't know how this happened, but somehow Kelly got loose and ran off, right? And so for the next hour and a half, Mike is like out in the freezing cold weather, you know, calling for her, looking for her. He can't find the dog, right? <laughs> and so he looked for like an hour and a half and then he came back in the house and he's like about to give up. And then he saw a, a picture on, on our wall of our three children. And he's like, oh my gosh, I've got to find this dog for them, right? So this is obviously, I'm hearing this the next day when he's telling us about it, right? Because now it's like one in the morning. He calls up my friend Chuck. Some of you guys know Chuck from church. 
And, and now they're scurrying through the woods. They're looking for the dog. And every now and then they see the dog, right? Because I'm assuming the dog's cold. And, but then it was kind of nervous. They didn't, he didn't know them that well, right? So the dog would run off. And so Mike had this great idea. We have a grill on our, on our patio. <laughs> so he goes home and gets steaks, starts grilling at one in the morning. He's grilling up these steaks, hoping that he can lure the dog in with that. <laughs> right? And I mean, I am rolling because... I'm sitting there going, man, he did so much more. <laughs> I'm the dog owner, and he did way more than what I would have done. And uh, I would have trusted that the fur, the furry little creature would have been all right, and I would have went going back to bed. <laughs> so, but what I loved about that story is like, like Michael, because of, you know, because of his care for us, care for our kids, um, he was willing to go to great lengths, right, to, to help Kelly come home. And just for you pet lovers out there, yes. Uh, he rescued the day. I don't know how it happened, but Kelly ended up coming back in and was safe and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, so that was my little story there. I, I think that that's hopefully you pet lovers get a kick out of that. Um, any, any, any feeds, anyone putting in their favorite pets? Dogs. Dogs. What else? <laughs> that's it. One person. All right, read them off. What do we got? What do we got? Pets, dogs, cats. What do we got? What do you guys like, Kenny? You like cats? You like dogs better? What is it? Raccoons. What do you like, Brian? Dogs the best? All right. Are there any little weird ones on there? Kangaroos. Seriously? <laughs> Brian has a pet kangaroo. We're going to get a picture up there. Don't tell the... <laughs> what else we got? Uh, Any weird ones? Someone's a penguin, I think. Oh my gosh, April, that is hilarious. Just that Finnegan. Finnegan's like the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. Put in what, what kind of dog that is, because a massive or something like that. Lizards. Oh my gosh. One of the greatest things, April, was <laughs> was when um Finnegan almost swallowed Luke. That was hilarious to me. Um, and so I just think that it's important for us to laugh a little bit, to share some stories, right? Because this is the kind of story that Jesus was saying to the people of his day, because he wanted them to get a principle, right? Um, and he's talking about something that is so, so important, uh, the relentless love of God. So this story is actually telling us about the love of God. And for me, What's fascinating is how Luke starts it off, right? How he starts this parable reveals something to us about God and his love for people, right? Because think about it. It starts off with this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Like, this is so backwards to me. Like, I would think that the people who studied the law the people who lived out the law and taught the law, they would have been mesmerized by this guy named Jesus, by this amazing teacher, that they would have been hanging on his every word, wouldn't be able to get enough of what Jesus was saying and doing, and yet this isn't what happened. So, and those were the Pharisees. Some of you might not know that, but the Pharisees were like the teachers of the law. They were the ones that followed the law to the T. And so my expectation would be like, it's almost like as a fellow teacher, right? It'd be like someone I would admire, I would look up to, I'd want to learn from, I'd, I'd want to know everything he had to say. And yet Luke is telling us that's not what happened. In fact, he's making a strong contention that these Pharisees, these know-it-alls, they completely missed the mark. But however, the tax collectors and the sinners was a very, very different story. And this would have been astonishing like, you have to think about that. If you put yourself into that, that situation, first century Judaism, the elite, if you will, right? The Pharisees, the ones that everyone looked up to because they were holy, right? And blameless. And they were ones of God. And then you had these, the others, right? The outcasts, these, these people that were often looked over, the ones that were passed over, the ones that were not good enough. And they were, they were um, uncomfortable to be around. They were kind of like the outcasts of society. And so what is, what is Jesus, what is Luke sharing with us 
about this. And, and maybe, you've, you know, before we're so quick to judge, maybe this has happened to you before, but have you ever experienced like seeing someone for the first time and you were like, whoa, like, dude, like, and you saw like this big, big guy, maybe like mohawk, different colors, piercings everywhere, maybe tats everywhere. And just like this huge burly guy or like this chick that like was scarier than everything. And, and you had made, like you said, made some internal judgments about how their appearance was. Right. But then like, have you ever had that? That happened to me before. And there was this big, huge, burly guy, right? And then like, when I took the time to get to know him, it was like, oh my gosh, this guy's a teddy bear. Oh my gosh, like this guy is like the nicest guy I'd ever met, right? And it's like, this is, this is what I think is happening here. It's like, Jesus is trying to get their attention and he's telling this story to contrast and to show like, wait a second, there's something very polarizing about my message here. And so the Pharisees, judged people and there was something in Jesus that was like you're missing something if you're going to be filled with judgment you're going to miss out on the message you're going to miss out on the kingdom because the the kingdom is about all people the message like that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. ultimately died for was about people being united from every race from every color from every religion to be one right so that the boys and girls could grow up together in unity but the Pharisees never took the time to get to know these people, to find out what kind of person that they actually were. So Luke is saying, wait a second, but Jesus, he sees the humanity of people and he also sees their greatest potential. And in that, right, when he had an encounter with you, he treated you that way. And there's something so significant about that because why were these tax collectors and sinners hanging around him? There was something like there was something on how they felt when they were with him. Like, because think about it this way. Doesn't it make you feel so good when people honor you, when they respect you? Or how about this? When they believe in you, when they see something powerful in you. Right? Those are the kind of people that you want to be around more, that you're attracted to. And so at the essence of this message, Jesus is saying, I want you to get that people matter. People are what matter to me the most in life. And I'm talking about all people. And so for me, it's like, because he loved all people, there's something that's a challenge to us today. Because who is it in our lives that we find challenging to love? So Jesus loved those who least expected it. And as a result, they loved being with him. Now, here's something worth noting. This reveals something to us about Jesus and his love. His love attracted outsiders. So you might want to write that down. His love attracted outsiders. And here's a question for you. It's kind of like a reflective rhetorical question. Does the love of God inside of you attract outsiders? I don't even like using that language. I'm just trying to make a distinction here, right? Does the love of God in you attract outsiders? So simply ask yourself, who are you attracting? Who's sitting at your table? Who do you hang out with? Who do you spend time with? Who are people that, that can't get enough of you, want to be with you? And, and, and I hope this is challenging to you as it was to the first century hearers. So these, these sinners and tax collectors, they gathered around to hear Jesus. And I have a sense like that they loved this, right? They loved hearing Jesus talk. They loved what Jesus had to say. And, but it begs the question, like, why? What was it that Jesus was saying that they, they wanted to wait on every word? I think it has something to do with how Jesus treated them, the things he taught, the things he, the, the things he stood up for. It gave them dignity and respect. There's something about when you look at another human being and they don't feel less than when they're around you. But actually, they feel like lifted up. They feel like, man, this person believes in me so much. Right? I can't do anything wrong in this person's eyes. That's how much they love me. And, and I feel like what happens to people is that they rise into that. right? Not because they have to. Not because they're guilted into anything. But it's like they just, they just feel the love and the belief that you have in them that they want to rise into that. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. I think it gave them something that was relatable. You know, like I feel sometimes like in my quest to learn about God, like over the years, I, I you know, like I, as I'm trying to learn something, I've taken on different ways. And, and 
And sometimes I was very pious, right? Like I tried to be holy. I tried to be blameless. And I feel like I alienated my friends that were, quote unquote, the sinners, the ones that were going to the bars, the ones that were hooking up with girls and all these different things, right? And, and I'm not suggesting like I agree with that or I condone that. But what I'm saying is they didn't love being with me because they felt something. I would call it like a sense of indignant, like I don't know if indignancy is a word, but like, you know what I mean? Like I was being indignant in my self-righteousness, in my, in my striving to be more like God, I was actually becoming less like God. And ask yourself those questions because I'm not alone in this. If people that are quote unquote far from God, if people that are the, the outcasts of society, the people that are quote unquote lost, if they're not attracted to you, I think that there's something wrong. So reflect on that. Because I know some of you that are religious and know the scriptures really well are, are all automatically having a defense right now. Well, what about this one verse? And what about this one verse that talks about like we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world and, you know, to remove ourselves. And, and I still think you're taking that out of context and you're missing the point of the message of Jesus somehow he connected with sinners and tax collectors at a very deep and profound level. And I think there's room for us to grow if we're open to learning, if we're open to discovering. It was like, I want it both ways. Like, I want to live a holy life. I want to live a blameless life. And I don't want other people to feel less than. I don't want other people to feel judged. I don't want other people to compare themselves. I want people to know that I love them and I'm for them and I want the best for them and I'm there to encourage and to support. And if they're ready and willing to transform their lives and I'm ready and willing to meet them where they're at. That's where I think Jesus was. Jesus was an open invitation at all times. And yet the people that hung out with him never felt repelled by him, never felt like, oh my gosh, like somehow I don't add up. I think it's just the opposite. I think that he touched like the core of who they were made in his image. And he brought out the best in people. And that in itself, these encounters, they, why did they love hearing him? Because it gave them hope that they too could live life to the fullest in Christ. Like they too could do this. Like that there was hope for them. That there was, it was possible. Like yeah, society was telling them a different message. But this Jesus looked past that. He looked past the labels. He looked past their past. <laughs> that kind of fun. So, but he looked straight into the heart of who they were as people. And he saw something that others missed. He saw something that the Pharisees stepped past. And that is what I think can change a person's life. Because ultimately, that's what love is. If love is filled with judgment, it's not love, in my opinion. And so I want to give you an example of a modern day example of this. So right now, behind the scenes, uh, Delita and I and others, but you might know Delita from our leadership team, um, I've hired Delita to help uh, lead Emerge Living. So we have a program called Emerge, right? That's the ministry called Emerge, and it's Emer Emerge Mentoring. So that's for mentoring kids who age out of foster care. So when they're 16, 17, 18 years old, that we come alongside them and we want to mentor them. Uh, and then we have Emerge Living. And so right now we're in the process of developing a business plan for that so that we can raise monies to buy a five to six bedroom home so that these young people at age 18 when they age out of foster care, they have a place that they can go and they can develop and to grow and, and to, to be whole and healthy and loved. And, and the, these same things I just described have dignity and respect that they can have hope for their future because they're going to be surrounded by people like you and me who can love on them and spend time with them and not look down on them, but just to pull out the best in them, right? And so I want you to think about this for a second. This people group in our society, most people don't know this. But over 23,000 kids age out of foster care every, every year. That means at age 18, they get a $200 check, a pat on the back, and then there's the door. Of those 23,000, 25% of them end up homeless. 65% end up incarcerated or messed up in the law somehow. Only 3% end up going to college. 71% of the girls, by the time they're 21, end up having a child, and that child inevitably ends back up in foster care. The kids that are found, if that's not disturbing enough, the kids that are found in sex trafficking, over 75% of them had, had spent time in the foster care system. 
So when I think about this and I think about Emerge and I think about mentoring and I think about living in community with each other and we're designing a four-year plan so that these kids can learn life skills and job skills and whether they go to higher education or they learn a trade, we're going to come around them with a holistic approach by living in community with others that can love on them and be with them uh, and create a life path together so that then when they leave us, they can contribute back to society in a way that's filled with dignity and respect and that they feel great about where they're at and the trajectory of their path. And so we're going to get to do that. And so I think that this parable catches the the essence of that because I think it would break God's heart to watch these young people end up homeless, end up in sex trafficking, um, you know, end up, you know, mixed up in the law, right? In in jail and drugs and alcohol and all those different things that, that go with that. And so for me, for a church at Stone Coast, we want to do something about that. And I, what I love about that is like by taking on that one initiative, we're preventing homelessness. We're preventing sex trafficking. We're, we're preventing incarcerations, right? And we're truly giving hope uh, and a future to these young people. But I was, I've been thinking a lot about like, what's it like for an 18 year old who has felt rejected and abandoned his or her own her whole life. Like, like I come from a pretty good home and, and yet I felt abandoned because my parents got divorced. Well, these kids go from home to home on an average of five to 10 times in their upbringing. So every single, I can just, I can't even imagine this happens, but it's like every time all their belongings are stuffed in a black trash bag. That's how it works. They just get their stuff put in a trash bag and then go, okay, DCYF now is going to now place you into another home. Really, it's not a home. They place you in another house oftentimes. And they never feel loved. They never feel... And, and some, don't get me wrong, there's some beautiful foster parents out there who do a great job, so please don't take this the wrong way. I'm just talking about this percentage of kids that this happens to. And that's why this is what this is meant for, right? Obviously, the ones that are doing it well, praise God, thank you for, for showing up and doing it at such a, such a great way. And, and of course, if, if you want to know more about how to be a foster parent, please let us know. Um, we, we team up with, with Boys Town, right? It's a national organization. It's out of Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And so this is important because I want you to think about how do we give dignity and respect to an 18-year-old who feels less than, who feels passed over, who feels like, you know what? My parents didn't want me. I've been abandoned. And now what? Like, I'm useless. I'm trash. Like, this is this trash bag re- reflection of who I am. I'm trash. And I'm saying, no, no, no. We're, no, we're going to stand up for these, these folks in such a way. My prayer is that, like this parable, they would be, these 18-year-olds would be the one who would be gathering around Jesus to hear him. Because they'd see people like you and me who come alongside them and love them right where they're at. So that they can start to see the goodness inside of them. They can start to see how Jesus created them and formed them in his image. That they could pull out of that the things that are are so beautiful within them. Yes, they're scarred. Yes, they're hurt. But my prayer is that they'll be whole and complete. They'll they'll come to see how how amazing they are as human beings and how much they have to offer this world here and now. Because how a person sees themselves, how a person views themselves is actually the trajectory that they're on in life. And so we have to come along and, and, and give them a different vision, a different picture, a different view of who they are. And it's filled with a view of you have great self-worth. Like we see worth in you. We value you. And so I'm reading a book right now called The Courage to be Disliked. And one of the chapters talks about this value of self-worth. And so we're going to put up on the screen uh, a quote. All right. It says, if one is able to feel one has worth, then one can accept oneself just as one is and have the courage to face one's life tasks. So meaning like like our life tasks are the things that we are responsible for, right? And that I am, I have a role to play in society. I have a responsibility, continues. So the issue that arises at this point is how on earth can one become able to feel one has worth? It is quite simple. It is when a person is able to feel I am beneficial to the community. 
that one can have a true sense of one's worth. And that just halted me in my tracks. You know, I'm thinking about emerged living. I'm thinking about these young people living community. And, and our vision is that there'd be at least a couple, uh, two, three, four people that at least two people that would be living there, right? Like oh, as like house parents, people that they would know are there for them, have their back. They're there to support them and love, love on them, to teach them life skills, right? Just to be those supportive people in, the, in their lives. And it's for a two, three, four year period of time, um, you know, when they feel adjusted and ready to go out and face the world, that, that they know that they have an emerged community that they can always come back to, right? And that's like this value of community is the is what gives a person self-worth. And I just was like, man, maybe Jesus, maybe he brought a deep sense of self-worth to the tax collectors and the sinners because somehow he looked past these other things that society had seen in them and he valued them and offered them to be part of a community that was bigger than themselves. And, and you know what's interesting? This community that they were a part of, it was about serving and loving the other. And I'm like, man, if we could ever instill these kinds of values in these young people who feel worthless, who feel they have nothing to contribute to society, and all of a sudden we show them, no, no, no. God has wired you, gifted you. He has so much in store for you. You have your whole life ahead of you, and you're going to make a significant contribution. You're going to make a difference in the world. You're going to have an impact. And we're going to be alongside for that ride. We're going to be in community with you. Man, that changes a person's life, and then that changes a community's life. And I believe that one of the greatest gifts we can give to people is the value of self-worth. And that value of self-worth many times comes from being in community. And this is what Jesus did when he was with the tax collectors. See, the word with means something. Like he was with them. He wasn't the teacher teaching at them. He was the teacher who was with them. And he was using real life stories that they could connect to, that they could evaluate, they could assess. He wasn't also like a milk toast guy. Like, it's not like he didn't have difficult conversations, I'm sure, right? It wasn't like he, he just, oh, he was fine with the way that they were living. No, he wanted the best for people. So of course he was gonna have confrontational conversations too, but he was able to do it in such a way, like there's a phrase that says, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I feel like Jesus epitomized this, like Jesus who is love. They knew how much he cared. They, they could sense it and how he treated them, how he looked at them, how he was with them. And this is why they gathered around to hear him. So another reflection question. Who are we building community with? I would suggest that it's important to have at least two, there's more than this, but at least these two. Even in spite of COVID and this pandemic where it's difficult to meet, and I would encourage you to at least be meeting with one or two, if not more people from Stone Coast, right? If you consider Stone Coast to be your home church, that you start to, to spend time with at least another person. So why? Because the scriptures talk about encourage one another, to urge one another on in our faith, to we'll grow more in Christ together, discuss the messages together, discuss, discuss life together, discuss how God is showing up in your, in your life together. Like discuss scriptures, discuss things that are, have spiritual matter to it. Right? Because we need to grow in our relationship with God and we need to grow with each other in that way and care for one another. Right, So our, our spiritual family, if you will. And then we also are called to, to spend time with those that are in our community. right? The, the lost sheep, if you will, using this parable. And it, it, we, we did a thing a while ago called Your Two Matter. And, and so I would encourage you to be reminded either... Either re-engage if you're not, uh, if you haven't continued with your two matter or start today for the first time and just think about who are two people that are in your life that you believe maybe God has put there for a reason. And maybe they, they represent, quote unquote, the lost sheep in that you're going to go after that lost sheep. You're going to spend time. You're going to be intentional. You're going to be prayerful. You're going to show them dignity and respect. Um, you're going to help see a need and meet a need, right? These are just different ways that we can be the love and light of Christ with those that are in our community. So let me let me talk about this other aspect. So that, that one's, I think, very, very powerful, this idea of, of the value of self-worth and being in community. Now, here's another one that I think um, is, is, a, 
is a principle that it's, for me, it's a new principle. I read it in the same book, right? And it's talking about vertical and horizontal relationships. Now I've heard of this before, like what I'm about to say isn't going to blow you away, but if you'll, if you'll enter into it with humility, it might change your life because vertical relationships, um, basically it's a hierarchical relationship. If you think about it that way, somehow like, uh, I'm better than you. So like if I'm your boss or I'm, you know, I'm very talented at something so that somehow I'm better than you. So when I talk to you, there, there could leak into that a sense of I'm above you, right? Um, you, when you need my help, right? That's another thing. If you need my help, sometimes it's a vertical relationship. Um, when I enable another person, that's a form of a vertical relationship. Another one in a negative sense is when I suppress another person, right? I, I purposely keep someone down. I belittle people. I keep them down. There's, there's all different forms of vertical relationships. And I need you to really like dig into that, to look deeper, to see how this shows up. Because I'm going to put forth that it shows up in all of our lives. Like I struggle with vertical relationships and so do you. You might like, oh, no, no, I don't. But I'm just going to ask you to look. If, you, if you're feeling that way, look more closely. Um, in, in parental relationships, we do this. Um, yeah, there's, and I'll get to this in a minute. I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about vertical and talk about horizontal. So horizontal relationships, all right, con in contrast, would be that we're equal, that we're truly equal. <laughs> One is humble and sees others as we're all in this together. No one is better than another or above someone. There's a sense of admiration and respect for each human being. Like, do you look at people and you go, hmm, I have something to learn from them. So I guess I would put forth, anytime you don't have that, that's a vertical relationship. Anytime you enter a room and you look at other people and you don't think there's something special about them, that there's something you can glean from, something that you can grow from, something you can learn from, that's a vertical relationship. It's a vertical mindset. This is powerful. This is so powerful. I, I want you to hang here for a second. I want you to feel the weight of this because this is, I think, at the heart of what Jesus is talking about because he's saying that the horizontal relationship was between Jesus and these, these sinners and tax collectors. The vertical relationships was with the Pharisees and the sinners and tax collectors and even with Jesus. And we don't often like to, you know, I don't like to think of myself as a Pharisee, but too bad. <laughs> I'm a Pharisee and so are you. <laughs> right? Like we have to kind of accept it because there's degrees of this. Um, so, all right, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples in a second. All right. Uh, horizontally. Let's see. I think there's something that tax collectors and sinners experienced when they were with Jesus versus when they were with the Pharisees. This is what I'm saying. It's these subtle things. It's the things that go underneath that are often unspoken too. Another person probably isn't going to tell you these things about yourself, but they feel it. They experience it when they're with you. It's kind of like what I said earlier, like when I was holier than thou and I was trying to be trying to be blameless and holy and, and my friends felt it. And I even feel like today, because like there's a part of me that um, I get so absorbed in what I'm up to because you know, I hope it has value, first of all, you know, help build the, the church, build the kingdom, all these things to, to love on people, to make a difference in the world, right? But like what happens is I get so self-absorbed in what I'm up to that I that I miss being curious to what's actually happening in another person's life. So that's a form of a vertical relationship. And I just know this about myself. It's, it's constantly there. It's something that I'm aware of and I have to constantly remind myself, wait a second, get curious, be a learner. You know, love this person for where they're at right now and get curious and figure out how can I be in their life, right? And so I just know that that's, that's what happens in my relationships with people. Um, and so I'm a work in progress. And so first of all, it's admitting it and being aware of it. So I'm just trying to coach us a little bit to, to, to look at that maybe a little more closely. So a horizontal analogy in this, in this parable is with Jesus, they discovered the sinners and tax collectors, they discovered they have significance and purpose. They discovered they had self-worth, which caused them to want to hear Jesus and live out his ways. I find this to be amazing. 
Now think about it. If anyone ever had the right to have a vertical relationship, it was Jesus. And yet Jesus came as a servant. Jesus didn't look down on people. Just hold on to that thought for a second. The one who was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who's the creator of everything. He was humble and he's teaching the people of his day about this new kingdom. It's not about power. It's not about overthrowing Rome. It's not about being better than. It's not about being first or second. It actually talked about those who are first will be last and those who are last will be first. He turns everything upside down. This Jesus, the one that we claim to follow, is calling something out of us at a much deeper level. He wants us to examine our hearts and our minds and our relationships and look for those little subtle signs like when you, when you think you're better than someone. It might even be more subtle than that. So let's look at some of the verticals. So with the Pharisees, the sinners and tax collectors were made to feel less than. That's how they experienced them. Going back to the verse 2, it says, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And that's when Jesus told them the parable. I want you to hear this. Like, Do you hear it? Like, the, Their words are dripping with disdain. This man, who does he think he is? And he welcomes these sinners. Like, how deplorable, how disgusting. Doesn't he get it? And he eats with them. Like, he eats with them. You know, and I put those low lowlifes. But he eats with them. Like, and again, because of the political fervor that's in the ear right now, I say to you, be careful. Because I hear that your language, I hear the, the verticality coming out of you in your Facebook posts, in how you treat people like them. Those people who differ in their political views than you. This comes out sideways in all different relationships. That's just one example. But I want you to hear that. Because the sinners and tax class who were with Jesus didn't feel that disdain. They didn't feel less than. They felt loved and lifted up, right? But these people, when they were with the Pharisees, they felt like those people who can't get their acts together, those people who don't know the law, they don't even keep the law, they don't deserve to even be in our presence. Like, get out of our space. That's how they felt. They actually repelled people. And I think this is an extreme picture of vertical relations, but it has an impact on people's lives. And so let us check ourselves and then ask, who would you rather hang out with? <laughs> would you want to hang out with you? <laughs> so here's a question. How are we, as followers of Jesus Christ, doing with treating others, and I mean all people, with dignity and respect? Treating people in a way that values them and gives them self-worth, regardless of what they believe, regardless of what they look like, regardless of their status in the world. And then why aren't tax collectors and sinners flocking to the church? Why aren't they flocking to Jesus? And why aren't they flocking to you and to me? This is so important. This scares me in the sense of when I talk about emerged living. Because we need to be people that are following Christ in such a way that they feel a horizontal relationship. We're not better than, we're not there to save them or rescue them or help them. We're there to be with them. We're there to do life with them. Like, get, oh man. If they would just know our love and know God's love for them. Because once I feel like I have to teach them something, I make them less than, like somehow I devalue them. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to come alongside, but that can we teach one another? Do you see how subtle that is? Hmm. 
So let me talk a little bit about vertical versus horizontal. We all struggle with the vertical relationships. All right, so here's where I think we're most vulnerable, right? Um, and this, you're, you might not like this example, but I think there's truth to it. Even in our parenting, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> I hate that. Do you wonder why your teenagers re rebel against us? It may, all right, I'm not judging you. It may have something to do with too much of a vertical relationship versus a horizontal relationship. How much time do you spend getting to know your child who's now a teenager? How much time do you spend truly interested in what's going on in their lives? I struggle with this all the time, personally. My kids are older now, but this is something I've hung on to for many, many years. Uh, how often do you just not have an agenda or get them to do what you want them to do versus you're like you're so curious about their lives and trying to help them like explore it and figure it out and, and mesmerized by who they're becoming and, and with all the good and the bad and the challenging. <laughs> Here's another place where we might be vulnerable is when you're talented at something, when you're truly gifted at something and you're trying to uh, teach it to someone else, you, you may feel like somehow you're better than that person. Or here's a big one, when you're actually helping others. So my example would be the homeless. When you're helping the homeless, do, do they sense that you think you're better than they are? Like, this is a great example. Those, and I actually, we, we reframed how we say that. Instead of calling them the, the homeless, we talked about people who struggle with homelessness. It's a subtle thing, but it's a way of giving dignity and respect. It's a way of saying like, no, 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 we're no different. We're all sons and daughters of God and we're no different. There's certain circumstances happen, certain choices, certain things caused you to struggle with homelessness. Just like there's certain things in my life that caused me to struggle with X, Y, and Z. See, the more I can identify with my brokenness, with the places where I need God's grace, that's how I show up to another human being. The more humble we are, the more of a learning posture we have, the more we appreciate people, the more that we see the value of people, the more horizontal our relationships. And I'm just giving you places to examine, to look at. And so for me right now, one of the things I love doing is coaching sports. And right now I'm coaching basketball. And maybe if you're an athlete, if you're exposed to this stuff, you'll hear it, you're like, oh, he's a, or she's a, a player's coach. And I feel like that's a, that's a really great phrase to use because somehow the, the, the players identify with you as we're all in this together. Like you're not above me. We're in this together. You, you have the role of coaching. I have the role of playing, right? One's not over the other. We're in this together. All right. So it's, you distill, you distill your knowledge and your coaching, of course, but it's in the how it's like, so when, when, when kids resonate, like I coach at the high school level, so when the teenagers resonate with you, when, when they know that you believe in them, when they know that you have their best in mind, when they know that you want for them more than you want the W, so that you can look good, like you can say, oh, look at me, I, I coached in such a way that we were 20 and 0, versus like the coaches that get this are always talking about their players, never about themselves. They're always talking about, man, such and such did such a great job. Did you see how the effort that they put in. Did you see how hard they were working in practice? This kid on and off the court, right? And, and then just always talking about the players. Now I struggle with this. This is like my prayer. And I feel like this year is like one of the, one of the first times that I'm, I'm, I'm getting it a little bit better, right? And I'm, I'm trying to be with them and just be like curious as to what's happening in their lives to put myself into their shoes. What must it be like if they're not getting a lot of playing time? What must it be like if they're working really hard I practice and yet everything's not falling into place for them. What's, what's that like in my life when that happens? And, and how can I come and meet them in that and then talk them through it and figure out together what's a great next step, right? And so does that take more time and more energy? Yes. Does it show them their value? Absolutely. And so, so I'm just giving you opportunities to look in your life. Where are you struggling with verticality and where are you living it out horizontally? All right. And then um, the next aspect of this, this parable is, is, and it's the main essence, if you will, it's the love of God, right? It's the relentless love of God. So picking up Luke 15 verses three through five, it says, 
Then Jesus told them this parable. So on, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he does, when he does find it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. So he will leave the 99 to go after you. He will risk it all to find you. Why? Because he came to seek and to save the lost. If I could give you anything today, it would be for you to know the relentless love of God. Like to know to the depths of your being how much God loves you. To know like that he is love, like the weight of that. Because that love will change your life. That love, it doesn't ever leave you the way that you are. It calls you to the essence of who you were created to be. And it's the most beautiful thing another person could ever receive. And that invitation is constantly open. And this picture, what what Jesus was saying to them is like, look at this shepherd. He's got a hundred sheep and one goes off. And, and one of the things you need to realize, like when Jesus was telling this story live, when he said this, this shepherd had a hundred sheep, everyone there went like this. They went, oh my gosh, this person's wealthy. This person's rich. He's got it all together. Like, why does he even care about the one? He shouldn't even notice the one. He's got a hundred sheep. Are you kidding me? Most people had five, seven sheep back then. This guy's got a hundred. So Jesus is exaggerating something that they would get. And he's trying to make this vertical analogy, if you will. And he's saying, wait a second, what I want you to get, even though it seems like Jesus should have appeared as to be this deity, and yet he humbled himself to be a man, to be a servant. And this this God that we're talking about, he's willing to leave the 99 to go after you, to go after the one. And and what happened was these sheep, like literally, they would they would uh, nibble their way lost, but they would end up in some treacherous ground. It was sometimes mountainous, and, and it was literally risking one's life to go and, like if you were the shepherd, like literally a physical shepherd, going to save that sheep would take something, right? You'd be risking something. And and so there's there's a picture here that Jesus wants us to get of, of the lengths, the depths that he'll go to to demonstrate his love for his children or for his sheep in this in, in this instance. And so it says, and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. This isn't some half-hearted effort to, to look good or, you know, like, oh, like I know that this will get in the local papers if we go and do this good act, right? Like we went after the one that got away. Oh, look at me. This is this is a picture of love and of dedication and of sacrifice. This is like, come what may, I'm coming after you. I'm chasing you down and I'm not going to stop. Like this is that song that we said, the reckless love of God, right? Like he chases you down, right? And this is an invitation of love is always right there. So you ever see the movie Taken? Some of you have seen the movie Taken and Brian's going to show you something, right? You ready? So this is from the movie Taken to show us like the lengths that someone would go to get their daughter back. So just listen, this is one of my favorite little scenes, just the audio part of it. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you are looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's my sense of humor. But it's like, I've got a particular set of skills that I will find you and I will kill you. Right? Like, that movie's disturbing. Don't watch it. Um, And it should be disturbing because it's on sex trafficking, right? But this idea that a father 
whose daughter was taken into sex trafficking would do anything, go to any length to find her and get her home safely, right? And so I want you to get like the love of God. Some of you are sitting there, oh my gosh, I just came to church and there's using an analogy of taken. <laughs> but this is like, this should, it, it, it should be riveting, right? I was telling you like Jesus used the stories of his day. I'm using a story from our day. And it's like, yes, it should do something to you because you should get that. Like God loves you so much that he would do anything to get you, to find you and to bring you home safely. When you're the one, here's an example. When you feel like the black sheep in life and you find someone who doesn't see you that way, you find someone who doesn't treat you that way. And maybe even just the opposite. Maybe that coach, maybe that teacher, maybe that neighbor, that coworker, and they, they treat you so valuable that I'm willing to risk my own life to find you. This changes a person's soul. This is the love of the Father. And he runs after you and he sent his son Jesus to show you how much he loves you. And so I'm going to close with this thought. The importance of a shepherd. Okay, I'm going to go through this one quickly. This is about hearing and obeying his voice. John 10, 3 through 5 says, To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And my question is like, seriously, who are we following? We spend so much time following people on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. How much time do we truly spend following Christ? John 10, 14 and 16 says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And this is what I was picturing Dr. Martin Luther King, right? One flock, one shepherd. Jesus is turning things upside down right now, right? Because it's so countercultural to say, I'm coming after the Israelites and the Gentiles. I got this flock already called the Israelites, but I'm coming after the flock called the Gentiles. And we're going to be one flock under one shepherd, right? And that's, and, and it's going to be up to you though, to figure out how do you get to know him more? And I'll just give you some real quick things to think about. But, but to hear the voice of the shepherd, it comes from knowing him, from spending time with him. So I want to encourage you just to spend time with God and just to listen. Maybe it's a daily routine where you spend longer periods of time each morning. Maybe you spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour just being with God in silence, just listening and learning and getting to know him. And then maybe throughout the day, it's called like little breath prayers. Maybe every hour you let your, your watch go off or your phone go off and it just reminds you to say thank you, God, or to ask him into whatever you're doing. And then obviously the value of reading God's word. That's where we're going to know him. We're going to learn his principles. Okay? So then this idea of following him is about putting things into practice. It's not just about like going on a journey and learning. It's not about head knowledge. It's about taking that knowledge and applying it. And so I ask you this week, what is one thing you can do to follow Jesus in his word. Like what's something very practical that God is whispering to you right now? Maybe it's, hey, maybe it's to forgive someone. Maybe it's to pick up the phone and, and to call somebody. Maybe it's to give to someone in need. Maybe it's to work on being more patient. Maybe it's to get over yourself and think of yourself less often and think of the others. Maybe it's to encourage another person. Maybe it's about taking captive every thought. Maybe it's about being pure. Whatever it might be, choose one thing that you can follow Christ this week. And then let me end with the value of community, the importance of the flock, right? Staying connected to the, the, to the bride of Christ, the value of community. And Jesus, he gives us this great picture in the book of Acts, and it's called the Acts 2 church. And it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes 
and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, those who were being healed and restored and becoming whole and having self-worth and value. So this is why we need each other. There's a, there's a story of a person named Jean Vanier, and he started a thing called Larch, the Larch community. So L apostrophe Arch. And it's, it's a home for kids and adults with disabilities. And he would say in his older years, he would say that these folks taught him more about being human than any other aspect of life because he lived in community with them. And I've learned so much from, from gleaning from him because he saw the value of a person, not, huh, not the way we often do. See, we usually, we usually judge people by their abilities. We, we often judge people by the value of which they bring forth in society. Oh, they have this great job. Oh, they're fulfilling the, the, the uh, American dream. Oh, these, they're doing these things that the world would say they're being successful. And these people had none of that. And they taught him more about humanity, about himself, than any other time in his life. That's what I'm talking about, about the vertical relationships and horizontal relationships. When you give yourself away, you will actually find your life, as the scriptures say. And so as a way for us at Stone Coast to, to value community and to get connected, we understand, like during Advent, it was great, right? We, we got on Zoom together and we connected and it was great. We connected with families from North Carolina and Maryland and in and, um, and different places, right? All around town in Massachusetts and, and Rhode Island. And so we want to do that again, but it's just going to be a, a one-time thing for now, right? So on January 31st or February 3rd, so it's a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, we're going to have just a time of connection. We want to connect with each other and we're going to make it fun. We're going to make it conversational. You know, it'll be, it'll be enriching. And so it's something that I want you to engage in and so that you can connect with each other. You can bring your friends onto it and it can just be a wonderful time for us to connect with each other. Okay. And so there'll be a link in the feed. You can just click on that, fill out the form. Just basically the form is just getting information in your name, email, and, and phone number so that we can um, communicate with you going forward, just to let you know the zoom, the zoom link information, stuff like that. But just pick out either the Sunday night or the Wednesday night. It's at seven. Both are at seven o'clock. We'd love to have you participate in that. And then what we're going to do is come back in late February and we're starting a new series called Simply Christian. And so it's going to be for the Lenten season and we'll do Zoom groups for that as well, right? And so this is just a way for us to stay connected to each other, to stay connected to God and make a difference. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kara. Uh, she's going to close the service, but I just want to say God bless you uh, and take, take one thing out of today's teaching and put it into practice, all right? And then I'll see you during the week. And I'll see you next week. Peace. Wow, what an incredible reminder this morning, Sean. Thank you. Just a great reminder of God's relentless love and that he will chase us down and pursue us. Someone this morning really needed to hear this. You might be in a place this morning wondering if you matter. If you matter to those around you, if you matter to God at all. I just want to reiterate uh, what Sean said, that you do matter. You matter to God. Um, you matter to his story of redemption and restoration. You have a role to play in that, and he wants you to know him and to love him. You matter to Stone Coast and our family, and we'd love for you to reach out and let us know how we can pray for you and support you. One of the ways that, uh, that God pursues us is through the love of others. So this week, take some time to sit in his presence, to pause and recognize how he's pursuing you. And this week, um, be someone who allows God's love to shine through you and flow through you. We love those that you, that you meet. Someone you know might need to hear this message. So we invite you to share this message so you can, they can hear these words. Also, a quick reminder to connect with us through the Connect card in the feed um, if you haven't already. We'd also love to invite you to be part of our community through giving to Stone Coast. You can do that in our Facebook feed or on our website. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We're grateful to have you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon.